Two years ago, I made a video where I tried to make a better and more accurate looking map for the board game Risk. It had many spots of the world missing, the proportions were bad, and you also had weird things like Afghanistan not actually being in Afghanistan. You can watch my full video on that to get the picture, but this time I wanted to see what I could do with the tabletop classic board game Axis and Allies. Axis and Allies is a bit more complicated than Risk as you have different unit types and territory types. You can also win by either an economic victory or by holding a certain number of capitals depending on the version. It also can be much harder to find time to set up and play the game compared to Risk. Someone once told me this game was the best tabletop game they never finished, and while I admittedly haven't played it in a while, I've also never really finished a game either. When I was growing up, I never found enough people willing to dedicate four plus hours to play it for a full game, and if I did, the game was never finished, and it was too much of a hassle to bother finishing. But, just like with Risk, one thing I've always hated about Axis and Allies is the map. At this point, some of you are asking which version I'm referring to. Honestly, I think the map looks awful on basically all of them. No matter which version you pick, it's just so ugly. Not the colors or aesthetic, mind you. I think those are fine. But I mean the land masses themselves. Missing a few small islands or cutting off areas would have been fine. But the positioning of the continents is terrible, Asia was scrunched, proportions are out of whack, so many other issues. The board for most versions is also supposed to officially wrap around, but the two halves of the Americas that wrap around do not line up properly. When I had similar complaints for Risk, someone in the comments proposed that perhaps it was imitating an old style of map like from the colonial era. Considering the imagery of many Risk versions I could find, that explanation is sort of plausible. But for Axis and Allies, I just don't know why they insistently print out these awfully inaccurate maps. They don't need to be perfect, but I feel like they can be done so much better. And look, I'm not a computer artist, genius, or anything like that, nor am I a team of people, so I'm not talented enough to add things like textures on anything I'd make. But again, my goal is to not change the aesthetic so much as correcting the proportions of the map. So I want to make my own version of an Axis and Allies map in terms of shape accuracy, but without changing the game's initial setup. I could make a lot of nitpicks about the economic values assigned to certain territories, or making certain territories touch each other, but I didn't want to devote multiple days to redesigning a whole new board game from the ground up. So I am willing to sacrifice several nitpicks to make sure my custom board could still work the same way. This leaves a final question of which version of Axis and Allies did I decide to recreate? All of the maps are ugly, but they aren't the same. I thought about the original version, or the anniversary edition that I was personally most familiar with, but I feel that the original version isn't as popular as later versions, and then the anniversary edition is out of print, so most people probably don't have access to that anyway. I ultimately decided to settle on the Axis and Allies 1941 board. It's a popular version that is also one of the easier and quicker ones to play. Now that we know what the mission is, I can make that map. But first, a word from this video sponsor, Ridge. Ah, wallets. You need something to carry around your cards and cash, but that typical leather wallet isn't the best choice. It can easily get dirty or ruined by water, and it isn't the most compact thing either. A much better choice would be a Ridge wallet. Ridge wallets have a sleek metal design that can fit all of your cards and cash much more compactly. The various designs also offer more style choices than the leather wallet in general, all while keeping a quality that will last you for a much longer amount of time. If you use the code EMPEROR with the link below, you can get 10% off of your Ridge wallet. So get a Ridge wallet today, and thanks again to Ridge for sponsoring this video. So to start out, here's a modern day blank map I use for several of my videos. I've moved it to where the Americas are split and along the edges, keeping Eurasia and Africa towards the middle, just like the original board. And now the board wraps around perfectly. To make it the same proportions of the 1941 board, I'll add an extra space at the top and there I'll add the logo and the production value numbers. I also added the mobilization zone box in the bottom right corner since that has the most open space. Next, I darken the color of the oceans to closer fit the one in the original board, while also getting rid of a few reservoir lakes that didn't exist in 1941. I also fixed the Aral Sea to its original size. 
The next step was to change the borders to the state borders of 1941. However, one thing to note is that the board game clearly groups several nations into regions or divides bigger nations into multiple regions. It's regions, not countries, but these borders will still help create more accurate regions. My first roadblock was how to deal with neutral and impassable zones. In this version of Axis and Allies, as well as most other versions, neutral regions are entirely impassable, but they also had impassable regions for the Sahara Desert and Himalayan Mountains. At first, I outlined those two areas with the idea of distinguishing the two, but since both were impassable anyway, that seemed like an unnecessary complication, so my solution was to ultimately add the neutral countries in the tannish white color of the original board, but add red borders for the Sahara and Himalayan borders to indicate those areas as impassable, rather than pretending they're the same as a neutral country. This allows for more accurate borders without removing that feature. I also added impassable borders for the Burmese-China border and the Sakhalin border for reasons I'll explain later. For the German zones, the Eastern European zone admittedly gets scrunched, and I had to add the Bialystok district to connect the Baltic areas to the rest of it, so it's not perfect, but it'll do. The front lines in late 1941 were added partially onto Finland and Ukraine, while the rest formed the West Russian territory. This was so the same regions can touch each other like in the original board, so the game can be potentially played the same way. The Soviet Union was pretty easy, but the Arkhangelsk region does admittedly look a bit weird. For Japan, I used its 1941 front lines in China to serve as the coastal China territory. Thailand was added to Indonesia to form that board territory since Thailand was a Japanese puppet during the war. But I made sure that unlike the original board map, that Malaya and Burma were separated. They're shown as Japanese on the original board, but Japan didn't seize either region until 1942. And while I'm willing to overlook some inaccuracies, I made sure to change this one. The US, however, I made a few sacrifices to avoid some clutter. The board gives the United States effectively any allied territory in the Americas aside from Canada, even Brazil despite Brazil not entering the war yet in 1941. I thought about giving British Caribbean possessions to the British, but that would be a little too odd for this. But ultimately, I justified this decision by remembering that during World War II, US military forces did often occupy British territory in the Americas to free up British men there. That means it's not that weird to show it under US control. China in the board game is shown as the United States control due to the fact that the US heavily supported China. It's a stretch to say the least. But for the purposes of this game, I have to keep it that way. But making the board territories of North and South China work for this corrected map looks really awkward. Just as the US occupied British territories in the Caribbean, the United Kingdom did occupy several European allied colonies in Africa and Southeast Asia when it could, after Germany took the homeland. So giving the British all of this doesn't seem as egregious. Since I insisted Malaya and Burma should accurately be kept within British control to make sure the same territories touch each other, that's why I added the red border between Burma and China. It was the only way to keep the accuracy. Malaya is also attached to the territory of West Indies for this reason. I also decided last minute to give Yemen and Oman accurately to British control, but as a part of the Middle East territory. After adding the labels, the new map seemed complete, a few names were altered for accuracy, but the naval zone boundaries left a weird giant zone for the Arctic Ocean, which is not on the original board. So as a final touch, I made that area a lighter shade to indicate it as impassable. Think of it as like icy Arctic waters. And with that, we have a much better map. But honestly, there's still more that Axis and Allies could do if it wanted to, I feel. Perhaps play with the map projections so that way Eurasia can still be larger, but without sacrificing proportions and shapes. Then again though, the boards for these games were bigger than most dining room tables I had ever known in my entire life, so maybe that doesn't really matter as much. I don't know. If anyone who works for the company that makes Axis and Allies wants to take some of these changes and ideas, by all means go for it. I obviously can't sell this for legal reasons anyway, although a name drop would be really nice. Regardless, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'm Emperor Tiger Star, and I'll see you guys next time.